Good afternoon. I'm Michael Ignatieff. I'm the Rector and President of Central European University. I'm speaking to you from Vienna, though we have a campus also in Budapest. I want to welcome you to this uh, very important uh, conversation and discussion about the prospects for democracy in Russia. Um, the great uh, Russian poet Chuchev said, um, you can't grasp Russia, you have to believe in it. And I guess our question is whether we can still believe in the prospects for Russian democracy. Alexei Navalny has just been sent to a penal colony and it reminds many historians of Russia that this is the fate that met the Decembrists who rose up to demand constitutional government in Russia in 1825 and were sent to Siberia for their pains. Um, this is a, a grim prospect for Navalny and for democracy in Russia in general. And we need to remember that the emancipation of the serfs and the opening up of Russia didn't then occur for another 40 years until 1861. So our question is if Alexei Navalny is the new Decembrist, whether we will have to wait another 40 years for democracy in Russia, which would be a truly grim prospect. So we need to, we need to examine these questions with a sense of Russian history, and we have a very strong panel of discussants who I'll introduce very briefly to you. We have Elizaveta Fort, who's a BBC journalist based in Moscow. We have uh, Ivan Krastev, who is the permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. We have Sergei Lagodinsky, who's a, a member of the European Parliament. Um, we think we will have Olga Sidorovich joining us at some point from Moscow. She's the director of the Institute for Law and Public Policy in Moscow, but has had a family emergency. She wants to be here, but she may be here slightly later. And we also have uh, Dmitry Kochinov, who's our permanent fellow at the Democracy Institute, and who will take over from me for the um, uh, management of the discussion <clears throat> around three o'clock, because I unfortunately have an emergency that requires me to uh, leave this panel, though I very much regret it. Um, I thought we'd start by getting around this uh, platform or around this uh, group of people as quickly as possible. I'd like to start with Elizaveta. Uh, if you're in Moscow, what are the prospects for democracy look like to you in the wake of the sentencing of Alexei Navalny to a penal colony, Elizaveta? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Um, it's hard for me to say about, you know, prospects of democracy in Russia because I'm not a political scientist. I'm just a journalist. But right now, uh, Russia and uh, the Russian opposition is experiencing a major crackdown, especially after the uh, protest uh, which we had in January uh, following Navalny's arrest and Sherry Mativa following uh, Navalny's poisoning. Uh, so right now, uh, like we're also uh, we're also in uh, another election cycle, right? So uh, we're going to have another uh, parliament election. Uh, this September, which is also very important. And uh, we don't know, we actually don't know, no one knows how this thing, uh, how everything is going to uh, unfold. Uh, will we see another protest uh, in support of Navalny and before those, uh, uh, this election? Uh, will this crackdown uh, continue? Those are all like global questions for Russia and for the world and we're just I, I know that people usually finish their the statements, the discussion, like only the time will show, but that's the truth with Russia. Only only the time will show because, I mean, uh, the government uh, has so many options now how to proceed. And the opposition, on the other hand, doesn't have many options because Navalny's, uh, you know, uh, supporters and members of his team are under arrest. He has been just sent to, to um, a panel colony, as you mentioned. So um, there is uh, much of uncertainty uh, in Russia. Many questions. I hope we'll discuss some of them today. Just want to push you on one issue, which is the parliamentary elections. 
yeah. when you see elections immediately, we all think democracy. These are, can you describe the extent and degree to which these elections in September can possibly be democracy, uh, can be democratic, given what's happened to Navalny, given the steady pressure on opposition forces in Moscow? In what sense are the elections, the parliamentary elections in September, democratic at all? It's really hard to say because in the in the West we have this perception that every election, you know, held in Russia is just not fair. But they're all different. We 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 actually see, you know, a different scale of like violations of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, voter suppression every year. So again, it's very hard because the campaigning uh, has just started officially. It hasn't started yet. So. It's really hard to say, but well, uh, I think it's fair to say that people like with liberal views, people who support Navalny, they just don't, uh, they don't have trust to, 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 to the very institution of uh, uh, elections in, in, in Russia. So it doesn't really matter uh, whether it's going to be fair or, or not fair. It, 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 what's really important that many people in Russia uh, even some people who, who who actually you know support Putin, they don't believe in this institution. They don't believe that uh, you know that uh, elections can actually change anything, anything at all, anything whatsoever in the country. Right. Okay, uh, Sergey uh, Lagodinsky, wh what do you see from your vantage point in the European Parliament about the prospects for democracy in Russia? Well, um, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to be in such a, a very impressive round um, of people and experts. Um, I, I think that um, looking from kind of from a distance a little bit, um, first of all, I think it's important to see that from the European Union perspective and from German perspective, um, we do have a, a, a West Europe, East Europe rift in terms of attitudes towards democracy, towards liberal democracy. Um, and um, so this is not just European Union versus Russia. Uh, of course, there are shadings and gradings and uh, various degrees, varieties of uh, illiberal democracy. But um, I think it is important to keep this in mind, and I know that Ivan is also thinking about those issues. Um, uh, we we have um, an, a his, historical issue of Eastern Europe embracing or not embracing uh, the values that we think are universal, but that, that they, uh, or many people there, especially those in power, construct as an, 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 an alternative uh, uh, proposal, an alternative model to our uh, Western European or universal uh, uh, human rights and rule of law issues. And we see it even uh, in other countries, like in European countries, like in Budapest and Hungary, if I may say this. Uh, this is the one, number one observation. The question is, how do we go about this? Um, the number two observation is, um, what I saw is, is quite hopeful, because I saw a new generation of Russian opposition and with Alexei Navalny and his followers, who are much younger than him very often, uh, though not as young as <laughs> the Russian authorities sometimes try to, uh, to present it, um, they do opposition politics in a different way. It's not Yavlinsky, and it's not uh, many others of the, of the early 90s, where the opposition politics was just you know, th thinking about liberal values. It's about doing. Right? It's about uh, decentralized uh, opposition politics, a lot in different regions. It's about digitalized opposition politics. And, um, and it's about uh, new innovative ways of doing opposition politics. And this is actually what, what I think why uh, Alexei is so, so important um, as a phenomenon and, and, and uh, the way he, how he does politics. But on the other hand, it's not just the new ways of opposition politics and innovative ways of opposition politics. It's also innovative ways of suppressing um, opposition. And that's where it gets really difficult. Because I think if we had the same opportunities uh, to suppress freedom of speech as we had in the 90s, this would be a different game. Um, but uh, digitalization and mass 
suppression. And uh, this hybrid way of, of, of kind of invading and polluting informational field is also the power and the weapon of those who oppress. And that's why kind of on, at the beginning, I was very optimistic because I said, you know, it's not just, just Tuchif, right? It's also Moses, you know, they, they wandered for 40 years in the, uh, in the desert. And then there is this change, you know, precisely what we needed. But then the others also have a new generation of suppressors and oppressors. Uh, and we will have to see, you know, in a situation where uh, uh, people are being put into prison just because they locate whether their cell phones uh, were in a certain area. Um, and many other examples, we, we, we can encounter them and enumerate them later. It would be very difficult to, to break this, to break out of this vicious circle um, and just as we see how difficult it is in other countries, in Turkey, for example, with which I also deal. Um, so we will have to see, but there is an, an, a qualitative change on both sides, and that makes you hopeful, but that makes you also a little bit cautious. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ivan, we have um, uh, parliamentary elections in the fall in which not even some of Putin's believers believe they're actually democratic. We have a proliferation of new forms of politics, which are very um, hopeful, and we have equally ingenious proliferation of new means of repression and control. Um, what do you see, Ivan? Listen, uh, I'll start with the fact that uh, elections are important in the Russian system in the way it is. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, how unfair they are, and they're important not so much for how much votes the opposition is going to get. It's quite important how much popular support the government is going to get. From this point of view, one of the most important role of the opposition, uh, of the elections in the Russian political system is to show that there is no alternative, not simply to the President Putin, but also to the governing party. And from this point of view, the major kind of Navalny effect is to try to break this, there is no alternative uh, understanding of politics. Uh, and the alternative most often is a person and not just an idea. Uh, and also in a situation like Russia, in order to basically get in the position of the alternative, you quite often should get into prison. Basically, this is where the Russian politicians meet the people. Uh, and uh, from this point of view, it's interesting to see what is going to be the effect of, uh, 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 of uh, Navalny. And there in my view, three contexts in which this is quite important. First is we're talking about uh, still Corona year. And nevertheless, what kind of government you are democratic or non-democratic, you know how volatile the situation is, economically, politically, psychologically. Secondly, I do believe to a great extent the Navalny strategy was very much determined by what happened in Belarus, also a place in which if you're going to have uh, discussions before, you're not going to imagine the scale of the protest that followed. I don't believe, to be honest, that Belarus and Russia are comparable personally, I could be wrong. Uh, but I do believe that for many people in the opposition, because if you're in politics, you're not like in political science. You're betting on small opportunities. You basically try to trigger events. You're not trying to explain what is happening. So I do believe, of course, uh, Belarus had a very strong impact on the imagination of the Russian opposition. And thirdly, of course, you have basically the Biden effect. Because, because you are doing something like this, expecting that the international public opinion and particularly the leaders uh, uh, of the West are going to react. If basically with Trump in the White House, uh, I don't believe that basically Navalny could expect the type of support that he got. Uh, saying all this, uh, in my view, it's extremely important uh, to try to see and not just asking the question basically how democratic Russia is going to be in five or ten years. To be honest, we don't know about our own countries how democratic we are going to be in five or ten years. Uh, but there is a big debate in Russia which goes both on the side of the government and on the side of the opposition. Regardless of the fact that we don't know when post-Putin Russia is going to come how the post-Putin Russia is going to look like. And this is something that President Putin himself is trying to basically imagine. Uh, this is the opponents of uh, uh, the regime and Mr. Navalny are trying to do. And from this point of view, this talk about the future. Uh, and this is part and I'll end this, uh, the paradox of the Russian political system. The strengths of the system and the weakness of the system is the same thing. It's anchored in one figure. 
The president of the Russian Federation obviously is a powerful figure, nevertheless, to whom the famous palace belongs. And obviously, he's the person who is structuring the system. But the story is that both for his supporters and for his opponents, the post-Putin Russia looks as kind of difficult to imagine as the life on Mars. And I do believe from this point of view, dealing with this uncertainty, part of the political debate is there. And here I do believe that basically Navalny succeeded in something that nobody before has succeeded, namely to put himself as a personal alternative to the president. And this also explains why the attack on him is so strong at the moment. Um, that gives us a lot to think about. I mean, one of the things you're saying um, about democracy without saying it is that um, democracy always has a future, comes after an election. Democracy always has a succession plan. You don't know what, who the succession plan will consist of, but you know it. In the Russian case, there's no succession plan. Um, Navalny has made himself the alternative. But let's get pessimistic for a moment. I mean, you go to a penal colony, isn't there a prospect that this regime, without a future of its own, without a succession, faced with Navalny, just decides to bury him or have him killed? And therefore, the opening, the possibilities that uh, Sergei talked about, that you talked about, Elizabeth, will simply be snuffed out. That's why I, I mentioned the Decemberists. I mean, we, you know, this regime may have a short uh, future, but um, it also has the weapons of control and power and oppression, and it could just snuff this whole thing out, no? Or am I being too pessimistic? Elizabeth? Wow. Well, I think, yeah, first of all, you're being too pessimistic. Uh, I mean, uh, um, you know, all eyes in the world, all the ob observers are now focused on what's going on in Navalny. And yesterday, I think, the head of uh, of the whole system said that they're going to treat Navalny well. He's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. I think it's very important to to notice that a penal uh, colony uh, where he's been sent is very famous for being like very close. Uh, they they basically isolate people from the world. You're not allowed to have phones there. Like it's uh, it, really the the administration of uh, this colony is in total control, and main people say that, like, the, the, like what they're aiming is in, in this colony is actually, uh, you know, to 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 make you lose any hope, to to isolate you from everything, and just to um, break your spirit in a way. We don't know if it's going to happen to Navalny because it's very important to understand that Navalny hasn't been in this situation. We know that he. You know, he has faced many arrests in the in the recent years for like 30 days for two months. Uh, he he has um, the experience of being under house arrest. He was uh, convicted at least like twice, three times, including this uh, veteran case. But he has never been in prison. And this is the whole new situation, not only for him, but for his uh, supporters, for for the whole structure or, or of, of the uh, of, of, of his fund. And we just simply don't know how they're going to address this challenge because it's a massive, it's a massive, massive challenge for them. Uh, I agree that um, I don't think that now they're getting uh, the support, I mean, from the West that they were kind of hoping for because Navalny called for sanctions against uh, uh, Russian business, and basically we haven't seen it yet. Uh, as for his supporters in Russia, just ordinary people, right? Uh, to uh, to help him, to support him, they now uh, have to take a bigger bigger risk because it's very important to 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 um, to to remember that last year Russia actually increased. 
punishments for many violations uh, related to produce activities. We're talking about harsher uh, sanctions for disruption of the road traffic, right? Something uh, what happened on in Moscow during during the last protest. We're talking about more pressure on social networks. They're obliged to, to delete any legal content, including calls for so-called uh, illegal protests. And it's very important to understand that we also have now legislation restricting uh, you know, illegal campaigning for candidates. And with Navalny uh, project, it's called like uh, smart vote or smart voting, uh, which uh, uh, is aiming to, to, to support candidates other uh, than from uh, the ruling party. And as Ivan uh, mentioned, yeah, it's very important uh, for, for the government to show uh, that the support for the United uh, Russia is still very strong, that this is the only alternative. So uh, like this, this project, Navalny's plan to, to support other candidates uh, very well may be disrupted too, which is also very important. Uh, the question is uh, like, is the government going to use this legislation and uh, so far, we've seen that they're determined to use it for uh, charging, you know, protesters with uh, different kind of violations uh, for prosecuting Navalny. Uh, it's also very important to remember that the investigative committee uh, also investigates another case uh, against Navalny, the embezzlement case in, in his fund and, and the penalties for it, 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 it's a felony, basically. So uh, they have an opportunity to keep him in prison, not for two and a half years, but for, let's say, 10 okay. years. But, but let me, let me, I, when, when you started your answer, Lisa, you said I was being too pessimistic, but everything you said. And now, and now I sound very pessimistic too. No, I, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You got me here. But uh, the thing is, uh, well, you said that uh, you know. Uh, well, if we're talking like about December, it's, it's very important to remember that December is the December. They basically started a military coup. Yeah, that's not something that we saw in January. We, 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 what we saw, you know, like 40,000 people gathered to support Navalny. Uh, it was not a coup, no question. No question. It, it, was, not, it was not a coup, uh, no question, yeah. And uh, like, let me, let me, let I, think, I think it's uh, like- uh, Lisa, me, just for a second, can I, can I move you on to, to yeah. uh, I wanted to move on to, to Sergei just for a minute. Right. Uh, which was that you said something I thought was important, which was, um, will the European Union, will the United States, will any external power have any influence on the course of what the Russian government does in terms of controlling and repressing Navalny and other democratic forces? Sergey, what's your view of, about whether Brussels or also the United States has any leverage here or whether this story will be determined essentially inside, uh, inside Russia? I, <clears throat> I think we have to do everything that we can, but I don't think that we have enough uh, leverage to uh, exert. And that's why um, I'm very cautious about um, uh, expectations also from the civil society um, um, especially from, from Russia, but as, as I said, also from other countries. Uh, I, I think that the European Union has proven itself to be incapable uh, to have a um, uh, resolute and effective foreign policy. Um, and uh, it's not a surprise on the one hand, because this is something that we've been telling all, the, all, all along, uh, that uh, we don't have the capacities uh, to do that and we have to change, to have structural changes to, to go in that direction. But on the other hand, it was a different, uh, 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 it, was a, it was a special thing to see this in action or in inaction, yeah? um, because um, we have hoped um, and being a member of the parliament, you know, we construct uh, resolutions and we, you know, we negotiate resolutions, we make proposals, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't, we don't lead you know, we don't have leadership in foreign policy. People don't understand this. And very often when we, you know, we wrote a, a resolution which was very progressive from that point of view, and then people from Russia, my you know, colleagues from Russia, okay, so 
next week, we have the sanctions that you, you, you said, you know, would be in your resolution. I said, no. So this was the first one. And the second one was with Borel, uh, because people saw that even Borel, even kind of the foreign minister of the uh, European Union is also incapable to, um, to have an impact, a real impact. And I uh, put aside the issue of quality of his press conferences, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for which we have criticized him. But for example, we didn't call and I didn't call for him to resign. Why? Because it doesn't matter. <laughs> because the next one will not be able to deliver either. Because structurally, it's the member states and the capitals who will have to deliver. And, and it's my capital, Berlin, who doesn't deliver for now. And I, you know, I, I, I praised, uh, you know, Merkel for his human, for her humanitarian uh, gesture uh, of, of, of accepting uh, Alexei and, I, and also for uh, her very clear stance, especially at the beginning, uh, in August, September, uh, even the foreign minister, the social democratic foreign minister, where they put uh, even Nord Stream 2 in question. And what happened? Nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that even the, the sanctions that we're, we're going to see probably by the end of this week, a couple of people more uh, on the list will not uh, be uh, able to impress Moscow. I think where we need to move is, is more towards um, uh, anti-corruption fight, uh, anti-money laundering, and these are different instruments. Um, it's not sanctions, right? And if I were kind of, you know, trying to be the architect of the, you know, the future of foreign policy, I would even think about reconsidering what sanctions, the nature of sanctions of European Union is. Now, this is a very bureaucratic, a very legalistic uh, instrument. But I think sanctions should be in the realm of uh, political um, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, discretion. And, mm -hmm. and this is something that we're lacking. It's not a political instrument now. It's an instrument where they, they are all afraid, I'm, I'm almost done, they're all afraid because they are afraid that, that sanctions are gonna be brought to the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Justice will say, no, this is not gonna work. Well, this is not the instrument we need. Um, but then, um, <clears throat> Ivan, what instruments are needed? <clears throat> Particularly, is there anything the, the American administration, the Biden administration can do here? Or is it also fated to be a bystander as it watches the internal evolution of Russian politics? Listen, there are two things. First of all, I don't believe that anybody can force Russia to do this or that in the domestic politics, because basically uh, it can have just the opposite effect. One of the major signal coming from Moscow is that we're not going, we want to show you that you do not have a leverage over us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do believe this is quite clear. And also, of course, that European Union and the United States, they're going to do this and that much more as a symbolic politics, addressing Russian society, but mostly their own societies, than hoping to change something on the ground. Uh, and to, for me, this is, uh, this, is, this is quite clear. And I don't believe anybody is naive to believe that if they're going to be, even if Nord Stream 2, is going to be frozen, it does not mean that Navalny is going to be freed or basically that the opposition parties are going to be allowed. I do believe that this uh, living in the memories of the 1990s is one of the worst things that can happen on the Western side. On the other side, I do believe that there's a certain type of a cost uh, that Russia and Russian elites are paying. And that has nothing to do with exactly what is uh, done by the European Commission or by the member states. One is, and this is in my view, very important Navalny effect on the German public opinion. For many reasons. Germany was viewing Russia differently than some of the other European countries. And of course, this does not mean that Navalny basically changed totally the perception, but particularly for the younger generation, uh, they identified Russia with something different. The, the fact that he was in Germany, that he was saved by the German doctors. Uh, uh, and from this point of view, one of the interesting story about Navalny is that we said that he's in prison, but listen, he was dead for a while. Uh, and this is something that people don't understand, the mystic of the fact that he's a lucky guy that should have not been alive. Uh, it is a miracle that he's alive and he's in prison. Uh, 
Uh, so from this point of view, I do believe it is quite important to, uh, to, uh, to understand this because part of the effect is not what is going to happen in six months, in one year, in two years. By the way, by the fact that some of his colleagues put certain type of a business figure on the list, which never is going to become official, nevertheless, believe me, they're making the cost for any Western businesses making business with these people much higher. This is what people don't understand in a certain way because of what he did, because of the personal courage to come back. Navalny got the power to sanction by himself without the support of the Western governments. But does it mean simply, basically, that Russia is going to open uh, in, a, uh, in a certain period of time or that the West is going to dictate to Russia in domestic politics? Not simply that it is not going to happen. I do believe it could be also counterproductive. Because one of the things that you can see in the Russian media in the last uh, months is that basically Navalny is very much framed as uh, working for the Western interests and so on, which is interestingly enough because what made Navalny very different from many of the typical liberal politicians from the 1990s, even somebody like uh, uh, Nemtsov and others, is that isn't, he's not a classical Russian liberal of the 1990s. He's a son of a Soviet officer who basically has a very strong patriotic feeling. The idea of the Russian pride and Russian dignity was important to him, nevertheless, that we can dislike uh, <laughs> this part of the way he was uh, articulated it from before. So from this point of view, for Navalny to keep this kind of a patriotic profile of himself is critically important. And for this, the West is not the major kind of a helper. Uh, try to make out of him simply uh, kind of the person uh, that the West is taken care of is, uh, uh, is also not going to help him. And for me, the most important is also to try to pay attention to some of the people working with him because Navalny's name is now world known. But can you imagine if you're a Navalny activist in the Russian countryside? This is what I don't want to be. Whose name is not known, who basically is uh, 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 very much under threat because one of the things that happened with the Navalny case from the summer to now is that he exposed also not simply the bad intention of some of the security community and intelligence community in Russia, but also the failure of this community. Yes, uh, listen, it from a Russian point of view, this is not a good idea to try to kill somebody, but it is even worse not to succeed to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not going to make you a general. Uh, and I do believe from this point of view, this kind of attentions, uh, this type of a stories is very much there. And I went on something for a long period of time. I do believe Russia on one side and the West on the other are going in the same trap. Uh, we all the time say, it might be rightly, that Russia is not a rising power, that there is a kind of aging and decay of the regime. But believe me, regimes can decay for long time. On the other side, Russia basically all the time, Russian elites see the West as very much decaying, declining, both the United States and the European Union. And this makes the situation very difficult because we are living in our own dreams. Neither Russia is as weak as as decaying, as we believe, nor we are doing as bad as they hope. But how does that, that's an important thought, um, that a lot of this is framed by historical narratives that may be false, but what are the consequences of these, this misperception on both sides? What, what is that leading to, Ivan? Expand your thought there. Uh, listen, this is quite important. In a certain way, in the case of, uh, of Russia, and particularly in the case of uh, the certain generation of the Russian elite that is now in power, which was very much shaped by the disintegration of the Soviet Union, they very much tend to see what is happening in the West very much as similar to what happened to that. So the logic is why basically the West is not going to dis disintegrate if the other superpower basically disintegrated before. And as a result of it, thinking in these analogies uh, and seeing particularly both European Union but also the United States as totally being in decline, uh, then you don't have any incentives to negotiate seriously now about anything. If I believe that you're declining power, better to negotiate with you tomorrow when you're going to be in a weaker position. And the position of the West with respect to Russia is the same. And listen, some of the 
reasons for this are also clear. Uh, while the uh, Russian government is uh, quite resilient, both politically and economically, neither economic dynamism, there was a, between 10 and 15 percent of the decline of the standard of living for the last seven years. Uh, and in this world that is appearing, uh, Russia is not China, let's put it like this. Uh, and as a result of it, many in the West said, let's wait. When we are going to discuss tomorrow, we are going to discuss from the stronger position. As a result of it, there is no real discussions between the West and Russia, but there is a lot of tension and everybody is totally annoyed with each other. And from this point of view, Lavrov, uh, a kind of Borel meeting, was a great story about this. This was as if you're coming in a, after the divorce court case uh, in which a former couple cannot stand each other. Uh, and, and I do believe it's quite important from this point of view, both on the side of uh, the West, because Russia can decide on their own, uh, to try to say this is the case, probably we need a period of social distancing. We know what we can achieve and what we cannot achieve. <laughs> on the other side, it's very important to show that doing this or that is going to have a cost. Probably we're not going to change the Russia foreign policy or domestic politics totally, but Russia is also not living on the moon. Many things that basically is happening uh, in the relations with the West is very much real. Let me let me let me pause at this moment, kind of see where we've got to. We 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 we've got a sense that <clears throat> Navalny is in a penal colony. <clears throat> this is a very strong movement, <clears throat> but to quote Ivan, one of the problems is. What is it to be a Navalny supporter in the countryside? There's a very strong risk that absent this charismatic leadership at the, at the center, it may, that movement may come under a lot of uh, pressure. We've seen that European Union is not gonna be able to do much. The Americans and the Russians are in a dialogue of the death about who's declining most. So then the, then the question I think shifts to another issue, which is, what is happening uh, deep down to this regime? I mean, Putin has been in power for 20 years. He can't go on forever. There's a biological limit, but there doesn't appear to be a succession plan. Ivan said a minute ago, this, this regime is not as decrepit and declining as the West makes it out to be, but it doesn't have a succession plan. So I guess my question is an odd one, which is if you're Putin, how do you survive? I wonder whether Lisa has any sense, just take off, put on Putin's hat for a moment and imagine what you have to do in order to survive. What, what assets does he have to, to keep going? <clears throat> and in particular, how does he use, manipulate democracy, quote unquote, to survive? That it seems to me an issue that is worth thinking about for a minute. Well, I think you should ask Putin because he's been doing great in that sense in the last 20 years. He, he knows how to survive, but I think the, the critical point uh, here is that um, Russian elites, uh, they still have faith in him and they still support him. That's just easy as that. And a um, uh, significant share of Russian population, right, uh, supports him too. And uh, I think that many people, maybe they, you know, like don't like everything Putin does, but they also see no alternatives for him. And this is a very critical point uh, for surviving because I don't think that many uh, people, like a critical share of people actually think, you know what, Navalny will be so much better than Putin. Let's support him. Let's get him out of prison. You know, he should be our president. There are certainly many people who, who think that uh, without any doubt. But is it, you know, a critical amount to make a difference? That's a very good question. And I think the answer is no. This is just my opinion. I, I may very well be wrong. And you have, uh, you know, great experts in like politics here. Again, I'm just a journalist. But, you know, to change the situation, what's again critical for Putin, Putin's survival? people have to be ready to take risks, right? And I don't think that many people are actually willing to take any risk. Not many people 
are willing, you know, to go to prison, to join the wall in prison, or to, to, to be charged with something, or to, to get fired, you know, uh, and I think it, it is very important to, uh, to, um, uh, to think about that. But I also think that in terms of the survival of this regime, uh, the, the, the coming parliamentary elections will, 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 be, will become a very, a very important indicator, uh, like uh, how much pressure and uh, suppression they'll have to take to show good numbers for the ruling party. That's also very important. And this will tell you a lot, like their actions in that sense, about the, uh, the, the, the state of, 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 of their, you know, about how, how they feel about the situation. Because, I mean, I, I know that many people say that, you know, it's a revolutionary situation in Russia. Next year, you know, we'll, 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 we'll you know, going to have another president. P Putin, you know, won't last till 2024 and then 2036. But I don't feel that kind of mood inside the country, being inside the country, and this is very important. I don't think that uh, anyone here wants a revolution. Uh, and it's also important that many people are now struggling economically because of COVID, because uh, just the factor of poverty is also very important in Russia. And many people, they just, you know, they don't have time to focus on, on that things. Okay, they'll, you know, they'll tell you that Navalny is in prison. Yeah, that's not very good. That's, that's not great. I mean, sanctions, they don't even care about it. I don't think that like an ordinary Russian actually cares about sanctions. And like Putin, yeah, I mean, I don't agree with him, but you know, uh, his, his successor may be, you know, just as corrupt and probably one, there's no, you know, the, the, the process of, of politics in Russia, it's so much different. It's so much, different from, from, from Europe. And pe people here, they, they care about other stuff. I, I like, you know, uh, like th there's a I mean, word me, in Russia, uh, apolitichny, like apolitical, non-political. And my husband is an American and we talked about it a lot. The, the, it's not even a word in English, like apolitical, this, this phenomenon, non-political, it, it doesn't really exist, but it does exist in Russia. Okay, so Putin benefits enormously from this sense of people just got other things to think about, apolitical. Um, and, but I, I guess, Sergei, the, the issue that then occurs to me is whether you see other long-term vulnerabilities in the Putin regime, in this, in this apparatus, um, or whether you think that over the long term, um, this kind of regime can just sustain itself indefinitely. Is there anything structural and strategic that leads us to think they're not going to get through the next 25 years? Well, I think the, <clears throat> the one, one thing that hurts this regime is um, um, because this regime is built very much on this one person, I think, and the apparatus that's it, but it's, it's important to have a person, uh, this person is the simple uh, natural thing that um, people are getting old. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what, what he is having problems, uh, the president, Putin, is to adjust to being old and getting old. Mm -hmm. uh, a a lot doesn't... of his, um, well, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree, but uh, but but a lot of his enigma, a lot of his um, this this something that buried him uh, for twenty years was this useful uh, charisma, right? He was alternative to to Yeltsin, right? I mean, the useful alternative to Yeltsin, useful but controlling uh, uh, and stabilizing, and and now um, he he is not able to find a role of being. An old, an elder states, statesman, um, and for that, that's why it is important for him. And I, this is what I see now: is to do two things. First of all, delegitimize alternatives. So they are starting well, 
uh, a story of Navalny, about Navalny, that will be um, repulsive and unattractive to their own population. And there are many stories you can tell. So one story, and it's actually that Navalny is telling himself, is, um, you know, there's basically only one story that you can tell which would be positive, is that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ told you, Michael already mentioned, or, or I think Ivan, you know, he was dead and he resurrected and came uh, to us. Um, it didn't really, you know, it's, it's, it's attractive to a number of um, disciples <laughs> who follow him, but it's not attractive for a huge number of people, especially those who watch Russian TV. And on Russian TV, we have the story of Lenin, uh, because this is, you know, coming back on Bronivik, yeah, on the, how do you call it, the, the, you know, returning back to St. Petersburg and going and to the, the revolution. Um, this is the story. Yeah, 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 by the way, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and people are fed up with revolutions. They are scared to death of revolutions. This is kind of the, the lesson, that uh, post-transitional lesson that people say, and uh, is being done again by the propaganda. And the other thing is, is the, the little Hitler thing that is being propagated now, uh, anti-veteran, et cetera, et cetera. So these are stories that he's using to, to reconstruct Navalny in a way that would be not harmful uh, to, to Putin. And the other part of, the, of this equation is to suppress uh, people, because it used to be that they led people to support him. They gave them to support him. And I do think that majority of Putin, and they're not able to do that anymore. So now they force them to support them. And that's why there was a conscious decision that was made, and I think this was a wrong decision strategically, is to switch from authoritarian to totalitarian at least partly totalitarian uh, uh, um, uh, instruments and suppress everyone who doesn't want to support Putin. And with that, unfortunately, and with Navalny being not just in the colony, but in the colony without any means of um, talking and, and communicating, and basically, you know, and after Putin, I, I think they're going to try to bring him in a, in a d psychological disarray or something like this. Um, I think this is not a very good prospect uh, for the freedom movement and democracy movement in Russia. I think they would be able to keep it longer than many people hope uh, for. And that's why we have to do all, all, our best to secure Navalny's security. I think this is the, 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 the most important thing that governments have to do. Uh, Paris, Berlin, signal to Russia, this is important. This is an important issue. Uh, and, and number two, try to support civil society as much as we can without you know, endangering them being labeled as, as enemies of the people. Ivan, um, and I, I'm just wondering, uh, we talked about Navalny, we've talked about Putin, we've talked about the sense that the vulnerability of Putin is simply aging and the aging of a whole regime. Is there any sense in which, uh, uh, Lisa said this earlier, that the elites still support this regime. Um, the block is still solid. Do you see any evidence of decomposition here in the in the social supports of the regime? Do you see any prospect that beyond aging, there's some cracks in the granite? Well, I very much uh, uh, agree with Lisa that in a certain way, it was the unity of the elite that allows the regime to function in the way it functions. Uh, and there's several things on this level. Listen, we should be also kind of, uh, we should try to imagine the world with the eyes of the pro-Putin elites. They see a country that according to them basically is hated by the West, which wants to be destroyed by the West. It wants to be disintegrated. The idea of the fortress Russia is uh, something that basically not simply the elites manage to push to the general public through the media, they managed to internalize it. While we're talking about basically what Navalny did, I can put money that 90% of the people governing Russia genuinely believed that everything that happened was the operation of the Western intelligence. It's not that they're saying this to the people, they believe it. And this is very important because we don't believe that they do believe it. 
but they do. Uh, uh, because in a certain way also there are people who have a very strong police view of history. They don't believe that basically anything is happening by accident. Uh, we were talking before it started that more than 60% of the Russians believe that COVID-19 is a biological weapon that had been invented in some laboratory. If a virus is a biological weapon, so what kind of weapon Navalny is? And I'm saying all this because paradoxically this is the mistrust that keeps the elite together. Strangely enough, it's not so much that they trust Putin, but they don't trust each other. Uh, and also because they don't trust each other, uh, this situation of staying together, uh, being in a fortress, uh, uh, allows them to survive, but you're surviving with a lot of nightmares. Part of these nightmares are very economical. Don't forget that one level is if all this green talk in uh, what is going to happen, this is going to have a cost for the Russian economy. And nevertheless, that Russia could end up as one of the, by the way, the biggest beneficiary of the climate change, when you see how much agricultural land can be you know, <laughs> in Siberia. Uh, this is going to be a major throw in a midterm uh, to the gas and oil industry. Uh, secondly, Russia is very sensitive on technology issues. And this is not by accident that uh, uh, Sputnik V was so important for Russia because insisting that Russia is a technology power is basically insisting that Russia is a sovereign state because what it means to be a sovereign in the 21st century. Uh, and I do believe all these questions are there and it is not simply the people, but this is also the elites and even some part of the elites which are critical to the way Russia is uh, governed that they don't know what future has for them. And this is the most important. And I was watching, of course, uh, Navalny film on, uh, uh, on uh, the famous palace. And listen, it's not about corruption, honestly speaking. You don't need to watch films to tell the Russians that basically there is quite a lot of corruption in the governments. People know this, every opinion poll, nevertheless, who's doing the poll is doing this. The message of the film was very different. The message of the film was, he has gone mad. This was the message of the film. Can you imagine who wants to live in a place like this? It's not about corruption. It is about somebody going and basically in the world of his own. And I do believe that this is going to be the story which is making uh, the, the elite nervous. And on the side of the structural pressure, listen, it's not only that the president is aging. He's governing with his own generation. And they're going to be a generational change. And of course, they're preparing for this, and this was very much what Putin was trying to do, but they're all the time promising that they're going to delegate the power to the next generation, and they're never doing this. Uh, and from this point of view, this is also a generation that is honestly slightly tired of being in power. When I was watching uh, Minister Lavrov talking to Borrell, part of the message was when two of us will go to retire. Uh, I'm kind of a pissed off seeing you and all of this and so on and so on. And I do believe this is important. And one of the other fear is the younger generation. And this is not that this generation is so much pro Navalny as uh, uh, many people claim. We don't know much about this generation, but this generation does not understand Putin anymore. They don't have a memories of the 1990s, but it is not only the problem of Russia. The problem of the people younger than 25 is a problem for everybody. Uh, but uh, in a regime like Russia, this is becoming and it is politically felt as a bigger problem than in many other countries. So uh, in the 1970s, Pierre Asner has this famous uh, uh, concept of competitive decadence. So he was saying, we are not doing well, the Soviets are not doing well, the problem is who is going basically to survive longer. And I do believe in a certain way there is a kind of a part of return to the competitive decadence. <laughs> Folks, on that, uh, on that happy note, I'm going to have to leave you and hand over to Dmitry Kochenov and thank you for this extremely lively discussion. I'm extremely sorry I have to cut out of it, and I hope that it, it will continue and we will soon open up for questions from our audience. Thank you, Elisaveta. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Sergei. And over to you, Dmitry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Let's, uh, let's speak uh, a little bit more about the, 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 the attempts of uh, those in power to discredit Navalny, uh, these Brunivik stories. Can it be that they're succeeding? Or what, what is your sense, Elisaveta, uh, in Moscow, especially given what, uh, what uh, Amnesty International has done uh, outside? Uh, could it be that this, this kind of message is also received well in the West as well? 
sorry. Uh, I'm muting myself. Um, I think that I think that's true because, uh, as we know, that Amnesty International got those messages about Navalny, you know, being nationalist uh, from uh, from countries from other countries other than Russia. It's very important, and uh, like it's it's like uh, it, well, his nationalist uh, views and statements, which he definitely had in the past. Uh, are certainly a problem uh, for him now because this is what every foreign journalist asks him in uh, in in an interview. Like the FT, Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they all they all mention this, and this is a huge uh, red flag for many people uh, in the West now because this is something those views are not acceptable anymore. In Russia, I think for for many people, they they feel that there's still uh you know sympathetic for that kind of uh rhetoric but uh, yeah without any doubts propaganda uses this whole you know stick very very successfully for many years and i'm sure that for many people this is something uh they uh you know take as again a, a red flag for them and it's definitely a problem for navalny even if he has changed massively, uh, you know, in the last 15 years, as he indicates, as his, as his uh, uh, team uh, indicates. Um, well, I think, yeah, it's, it's uh, very important not to uh, underestimate the, the power of propaganda in Russia, because uh, we've seen a major suppression of independent media in Russia and this uh, a never-ending war with like foreign agents with uh, you know independent journalists and uh, they mark people as like I, I can tell you when when I you know uh, pursue any kind of a story and talk to different people forget politics pretty much everything many people are very nervous about you know talking to me because I'm from the BBC and it's very, 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 very suspicious. And the fact that Navalny and his team are very much relying on, on the Western support, I mean, that's also, uh, that looks very suspicious for many people too, because they kind of prove, uh, it, it kind of proves Putin's point that like Navalny is back for the CIA. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it definitely looks like, like a proof for many people. So yeah, I think they're somewhat successful. Of course, I mean, uh, the, the, my, my favorite story of this winter is this uh, massive uh, protest wave on uh, Russian TikTok, speaking of like uh, the, this generation of um, uh, 25, 26 uh, year old people and even younger because TikTok is for basically for, 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 for children, right? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I think, yeah, this, th this is the, the major problem for him is how to win the hearts of the youth. Because uh, like I, 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 I wrote this piece about how, uh, how, how officials were preparing for, for the protests, which, uh, which we had like this January and literally, uh, you know, teachers, in schools, they warn children and parents, like, don't let them to attend. It's very dangerous. Save the children, you know, from Navalny. And I'm pretty sure that some people are sympathetic with this message. Of course, uh, we also we, we can also see that w more than 100, you know, million people watched this 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 uh, video about uh, the the so-called Putin's palace. But we also see that one uh, that this this level uh, of this, this number of views doesn't necessarily uh, convert to um, street protest participation, right? Because we, 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 we haven't seen, you know, 100 million people on a street. We haven't even seen this one, is one, a, one, this one, is a great point. one, can one, I, one hundred thousand. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much with uh, Ivan on that, that like, it's, uh, yeah, corruption is a serious problem for regime. And uh, even Putin, you know, sometimes, you know, says that, yeah, c corruption is bad. It's a major problem for us, but, uh, you know, other countries, you know, have this problem too. Uh, but it's also important that, that yes, everyone 
in Russia knows that, yeah, you know, uh, government officials are corrupt. They have palaces. They have, you know, so it's uh, a Europe, it's a, tech, so, it's a, it's a technological uh, technological fight between the government and between Navalny supporters. Yeah, it, of course, it's very much a technological so fight. Let, 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 let me, that they have this crackdown on social networks. Yeah, of course, it's the part of this bigger process. It's very but important. Let me turn to Sergei to ask uh, what what can be done from the from the Western side, as it were, in order to make sure that Russian Russian propaganda, the government propaganda, doesn't at least succeed in the West. And that's, uh, I, I think I would agree with Elizabeth entirely uh, that this, uh, the, the, this case of, uh, of uh, Amnesty International shows that, uh, in fact, the, 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 power, the power of the message that the government is sending is as strong as inside as it is strong outside of the country. So can, uh, can the European Union do something about it, Sergei? Uh, to be honest, I'm not. I'm not sure that that this this whole Amnesty International thing um, had such a resonance, um, at least in the German media. I was a bit surprised that um, it didn't really uh, make it to the headlines. I think there, uh, uh, Ivan mentioned it. Um, uh, the, the 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 Navalny factor uh, stands um, and and kind of holds the ground. Um, it is uh, uh, always a question, and a question that I personally, for example, as a green politician, have to explain again and again and kind of justify my support um, uh, uh, for uh, the right uh, of Navalny to live, <laughs> to survive, even with his nationalistic part, uh, past. Uh, but, but, but I think that the, kind of overall, it's, it's already been um, kind of this battle is is over uh, uh, here, and uh, it's a different type of, um, uh, of of ideological battles that we're fighting. Because I, I don't think that the Navalny case. <clears throat> I think everyone agrees that he shouldn't have been poisoned, <clears throat> and he shouldn't have been uh, jailed uh, now. But uh, the question is, what follows from that? Who was behind that? The conspiracy theories, um, uh, you know, you know, even even people, you know, saying that, you know, putting us all in one basket, the Yale University thing. So, so that's that's kind of the the game that is being played now here, and it's being played, of course, not without uh, the the use from outside. What we have in Germany also uh, is this special thing with commemoration politics. And I think that, you know, we, ha we all have seen how the Putin uh, government regime, whatever you want to call it, from the early 2000s have started working on the uh, great, uh, uh, how to call it, the great paternalist, great paternal war, or whatever you want to call it, the Second World War, um, and kind of building it into a state a agenda and state ide ideology. And I, I think it was more, for, for a very long time, it was more kind of as an aesthetics or culture ideology. And now for the first time we have seen how they weaponize it in order to uh, delegitimize an opponent. And, and I, I think it's ridiculous how it's being done. If you look at it from outside, but if you have been part of this cultural 20 years um, uh, brainwashing, yeah, you are actually apt to say, yeah, we, we agree with that. You don't treat our veterans the way uh, that Navalny was treating our veterans. And I'm, I'm talking about maybe for those who don't know about the case and the, and, and, and the trial uh, where he was um, um, uh, accused of... Um, saying untrue things, untrue facts about the veteran, even though he didn't even meant him uh, uh, personally. Um, so, so these are the games that are being played. And uh, in, in Germany, I think people are watching it because a lot of progressive people are cautious about, you know, what kind of lessons do we draw from the war experience? Do we owe something? Do we have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Russia? And my answer would be, we don't have responsibility. We have responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, but not vis-a-vis -vis Kremlin. And we do have responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the former Soviet Union, but not vis-a-vis -vis Russia alone. And that is already a diversity of uh, responsi historical responsibilities that we should be 
having. But of course, the, the, the attempt is to say, you know, you, you owe, you, you know, the commemoration owes it to Kremlin and not to anyone else. And that we should, we should try to resist. Dmitry, can I interfere for one second to, to following your question about the effectiveness of Russia propaganda? Just, I'll be very short. I just want to bring some numbers to this conversation. This is from Levada's poll published in December before the, uh, the investigation about the Putin's palace came out, but after uh, the, another investigation about the alleged uh, FSB uh, involvement in Navalny's poisoning. So 30% of Russians actually think that his poisoning was staged. Uh, like another 19% uh, believes that that was provocatia, like uh, it was done by uh, the Western security services. 15% uh, believes that the government tried to kill him because he's Putin's political opponent, right? 15%, that's not, you know, that's not a lot. 7% thought that that was just a revenge by some people he investigated in the past. 6% thought that there was like an internal battle between different liberal like uh, opposition politics in Russia, 7%. Uh, and 1% uh, like uh, of, 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 of those who took part in, in this uh, poll, a thought that, that he just experienced like a regular food poisoning or something. And 20% said that they just don't know what happened. But again, 30% of those who took part in this poll actually think that this whole thing was staged, that he was never poisoned. And this- well, It's an confirmation of, of what- This tells just, you a uh, lot uh, about, you know, how effective Russian propaganda and especially Russian state TV is ridiculous things can be extremely effective. And then yeah, my, question course, to, my question to Ivan would then be, uh, uh, what, what can we do in the European Union in order to, in order to deal with, uh, with, this, uh, with these ridiculous things precisely, if we know how effective they can be, uh, both inside and outside of Russia? So, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm absolutely divided on this. The, uh, there are moves in the Baltic states, for instance, to, to, to kick the Russian, the Russian TV channels off the air. Uh, the, there are conversations at the supranational level and in, in different institutions institutions on introducing some kind of anti-propaganda agencies at the European Union. Do you think uh, this, uh, this uh, all uh, makes any sense and could be effective and whether we should fight with, uh, with propaganda in this way at all? Listen, uh, for me it's very important to uh, start with the fact that Russians are not the only ones that believe in the ridiculous things. So from this point of view, this is not only uh, the state monopoly of the television that explains everything. There is also one thing that we should recognize. Navalny achieved something which is really the most important in politics. People recognize who he is. Don't forget, for 10 years he was a blogger. He was the Berlin patient. Uh, in a certain way, the most difficult in politics is to learn who you are. Before people basically having any opinion on you, you should be on the stage. And he entered the stage because of three things, which in my view are very simple, but very important in a, this kind of a world of high mistrust. One is personal courage. Listen, you can talk a lot about agents and so on, but what I have read in literature is normally agents fly out of the countries, not within the countries, when there is a crisis. Secondly, you have this young, handsome man who basically stands for something. And this kind of that you're ready to risk your life and to sacrifice your life for anything, even if you don't agree with his ideology, is very important because the major mood, and not only in Russia, is there is nothing worth sacrificing your life for. And thirdly, he created a group of people who are incredibly loyal to him. Person taking a risk which is not lower than the risk he's taking himself. And this is why after a period in which the Russian media basically was never mentioning him, he was Mr. Nobody, now, probably, I'm sure that if we're going to do some media analysis, he was mentioned more times than the Russian president for the last one month. And of course, this is going to create a lot of 
propaganda effects. And of course, it's very easy to tell people, listen where he comes from, exactly what he's doing. But don't forget, uh, and even this Amnesty International story from this point of view is ridiculous because if you start looking for the way not to support people, you always can find. Now everybody is saying that uh, Andrei Sakharov was the saint of the dissident movement. Listen, he did a bomb. He did a bomb. Uh, so from this point, yeah, yeah, no, no, and I'm saying this because paradoxically all these saints become saints after you go through this type of a propaganda story. And he went, and now in the public uh, mind of the Russians, there is this guy, Navalny, and 50% of the people, they don't know what to think about him. Some of them perceive him obviously as a, uh, as a threat, and they are 15, 20. I agree very much with Elizabeth who said, basically this is somebody that probably is a kind of alternative, even not a political alternative, but behavior alternative to what is going on. Uh, but from this point of view, opinion polls are not extremely supportive because the situation can change very quickly. And uh, this is why the problem of the aging is critical. Listen, uh, Lukashenko, which people normally try to ridicule, was a very successful political leader. He managed to create a nation. He managed to survive being press balls from the East and from the West. But suddenly, at one point, people that have been tolerated him even when they don't like him and so on, they said, enough is enough. And they don't have reasons for this. He didn't do anything different than before. And I'm saying from this point of view, what I do believe people like Navalny are always betting on is that they're going to provoke the regime to overreact, to do certain things that is going to trigger the reactions. You never can, in a certain way, defeat regimes like this. They always can defeat themselves. Uh, and from this point of view, this is quite important to understand what he get and what he lost. And this, of course, years in which he's going to be in a penal colony uh, are going to be critically important. And I very much agree with the colleagues who said, we don't know how he's going to survive there. It's not easy. The pressure is also going to come from the prisoners he's staying with. I was reading a report somewhere saying that all these people who are in this colony, they feel so unhappy because they know that everybody's going to watch them now. This is going to be the most popular and the most important colony in the Russian penal system. Uh, so from this point of view, what he managed to produce, and in my view, slightly Navalny is like the COVID-19. He didn't disrupt the system, but he made visible many of the problems that the system had. In the same, basically the virus did not basically disrupt our world, but he basically exposed weaknesses, the problems that we have on the level of society, on the level of the health system, on the economic system. Uh, and, uh, and, this is, and this is at least how I'm seeing this. Should be propaganda against propaganda? Listen, it is always propaganda against propaganda. And that's you're good, always calling great. your propaganda anti-propaganda. Uh, uh, and of course, what is changing very much is that, of course, what is happening, and this is very much the technological moment, is that most of the time when you go into social media and others, you don't know not simply who is on the other side. On the other side does not need to be a person. Uh, you believe that you can change somebody's mind, but you cannot change Bolt's mind. Uh, and from this point uh, to Elizaveta's remarks, when, we, when, when she started sp uh, speaking about the new rules that, uh, that make it uh, more difficult to basically exercise your basic freedoms, to, to stay in the street in a certain, in a, in a, in a certain part of town, uh, to, to express your views. Uh, that's one level. But there are also significant changes at, at a different level, a high level. Uh, namely, I have, I have the change of the constitution in mind. So yeah. do, would you see the, the constitutional amendments uh, of uh, the last summer as part of the same, as part of the same trend? Of course, probably they are. But what is their role? And what is, uh, what, the, what is the role? The answer is short, absolutely. Well, uh, I mean, what was their role? I mean, it's, for me, it's really hard to say because, you know, uh, like, um, on the one hand, I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, some people in the government just thought that it was time to change the constitution, OK? 20 years, uh, even more, like 30 years, we'll live with this constitution. Okay, let's change something. Uh, another thing is Putin 
definitely like some people say uh that his main goal is to you know uh, stay in history to be this historic figure and in that sense it's very important to make you know moves like that like changing the constitution uh, but it's the Brezhnev style staying in history isn't it no but well, here, but, uh, I do believe everybody of us has an opinion on this, but there is one thing that I do believe is wrong in the way many people, particularly in the West, uh, the West are reading Putin. We basically talk about uh, the corrupt regime and we, talk, we saw basically the kind of villas that people are building. But to believe that somebody who is for 20 years in power is staying in power just for money, only underpaid assistant professors can believe it. You are there for glory. You want basically for Russia as a great power. You want basically to survive. And what you care about is not simply the time when you are going to be in power. You want to be sure that when you are not there, it's your vision of Russia that is going to stay there. And I do believe this is the biggest problem. And for Putin, the most important, and from this point of view, I do believe COVID-19 was a bad, uh, a bad luck for him. For him, the most important always was to have the initiative. Even though it's the constitutional change. Yeah. So let's have something in the Senate. Is this initiative with the institution really so important historically? I, I really think that it's also important to remember that Putin is an opportunist. Like people actually, sometimes, you know, people, people would ask like, what is his plan? What does Putin want? Well, I'll tell you, no one knows. I mean, he takes his chances. And with those amendments, he, he created so many chances, so many, so many options for, for him. He, he, he can stay... What's that? Uh, he can stay. He can stay in power if he wants. He can work uh, for the Security Council and be the head of the uh, Security Council if he wants. No, not Security Council. It, it, it's called like Государственный Совет, the the State Council. State Council. State, state the, the State Council. He uh, he 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 can you know uh, work uh, as a senator. So many options, and that's very 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 important for him, uh, I believe. And I don't know if it was his initial uh, plan to reset the clock on his presidential terms, which he did. But well, he did it when he could. He took that chance, and you know what? It it went. Uh, really well because we we actually it's very important to understand that there uh, there were no serious protests after after this decision or after uh, the, the the actual the actual voting uh because well partly because navalny said that you know what we're not going to protest we just think it's illegal and uh it, like uh what when, when we have like what the one when, when russia will be ours we're just going to 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 to, to cancel this just just to throw this out to to state that that was illegal and those amendments you know that they one state in the constitution. So, uh, it, like, basically, uh, he managed to uh, legalize his, uh, him staying in power without any, without any reaction from, 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 from Navalny, from, from, from the society. Uh, and I think it also indicates that the timing was great. The timing was great because we had COVID, right? Uh, he also managed, uh, like, it's also very important that they managed to introduce this new legislation, which, which allows to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to spend like, uh, for, to, to allow to, to, to hold elections during like three days, which increases, you know, uh, risks for violations because it's very hard to observe something which, you know, lasts for three days in a row. It's a, it's a, it's a huge pressure on, on observers or on, you know, like politicians. And he was also very successful at uh, doing this. So I think uh, that was a huge win for him in so many ways. Short term, not long term. Uh, what? So, Sergei, what, what do you think is the most important, the most significant of these amendments? Is it Putin staying in power? Or is it something else? And what, what I have in mind, and probably what you could uh, express your views on, is the relationship between Russian law and the, and the Council of Europe. And uh, yeah. the ability that yeah. the constitutional amendments gave uh, to the Russian Constitutional Court. 
uh, not to follow the decisions of the of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, yeah, I, I I wanted to say um, I would say all of the above. The whole bunch of this uh, of those of those amendments have. You know, and we can talk about the details and whether this this whole uh, primacy of the Russian law over international law is legal at all, which which you know legally doesn't it didn't change anything, but <laughs> de facto it 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 created a, an appearance of kind of sealing um, and certifying the formal transition uh, of Russia from the ra the uh, rails of uh, liberal. Uh, Western-oriented democracy, both liberal and Western-oriented, and put it on the rails of a liberal and not international-oriented democracy, and that's that's what what it was about. Uh, that that's that's how I I saw those changes, and that's how I see this this change of you know primacy of because this it doesn't change anything. But now they can they can use it, you know, legally in our legal little world parallel universe. But in the real universe, they just refer to that, and people say, "Yeah, of course, we voted for that. That's uh, that's how it is, and that's how it's it's supposed to be." Um, so so uh, I I think that kind of the, this was a big campaign of remodeling Russia's future and Russia's vision uh, uh, into a, an, a liberal vision, and before that. You could say, you know, that's the reality. Now you can say it's the reality and the constitution. So it's even better. I think it's also important that the shape of this, uh, you know, vote was very smart because along with political amendments, they also introduced like social security amendments and among like all poverty and all those risks and, uh, you know, with people uh, struggling economically, they could uh, either take it all, political amendments and social security amendments or uh, refuse everything and of course many people choose to you know vote for like you know like pensions and that kind of stuff uh, along with him resetting the clock uh, on his presidential terms and so on so the shape was also very very smart we have only eight minutes left so i wonder whether we could make a uh, make a last round three minutes per person uh to react to Chuchev's statement as it were and to and then to sum up our views. So I, I, I give the floor to Ivan. So I just wanted to, to very much back the colleagues is that what the president basically is maximizing is not closing any option for himself. But the real test for him is going to be 2024. And this is going to be the test. Do people want him to stay forever? It's not about even are they going to protest or not. The biggest problem is to what extent they're going to believe that, for example, the situation is so bad, Russia is under such a pressure. And I'm saying this because the only scenario under which people can very much say, no, no, don't leave, stay here, stay for 10 more years, is that if they believe that the country is under huge pressure from outside. Uh, and this, in my view, is important because from this point of view, personally, President Putin does not have an interest to hold the tensions with the West. If the situation gets slightly normal, if basically the Russian public does not feel under threat, it's very difficult to decide why you should give him 12 more years in power. Uh, and this is why I do believe that the next three, four years, regardless of what the opposition is going to do, regardless of how vegetarian all the uh, Western sanctions are going to be, psychologically, unfortunately, both sides do not have any incentive to go to any type of a constructive relationship. Uh, and this is, uh, this is why I do believe from this point of view that uh, I'll be very much surprised if uh, Navalny is going to be out before 2024. Uh, because uh, 2024 is the year that is going to matter. Uh, and it's not going to matter in terms of how many people are going to vote for whom, but how uh, President Putin is going to decide, should he take the risk to send to the Russian public the message we're going to stay together for a very long time. 
Wonderful. Let's uh, let's move to Elisaveta. There, 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 there are some uh, questions from the public, but I think uh, the, the both uh, main questions have been already addressed in the debate. The, f the first does. one is: Do you really believe that there is any suppression in Russia? I think we can we can shove it aside. Uh, and this, uh, the second one is: uh, Why Putin is such a danger? Why 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 uh, Navalny? Sorry, is such a danger to Putin. Uh, and uh, th this, is pre this is precisely what we have been talking about for one hour and a half. Uh, so I, I give the floor to Elisaveta. Yeah, so I'm going to be really short. You know, the old uh, Navalny's block name, block name was the final battle between good and neutrality. And this is uh, the main question for me. Uh, like, are Russian people going to stay neutral and what's their definition of good? Uh, and it's really, really, really hard to give the answers to those questions for me because it's very unpredictable because we don't have um, good sociology to, 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 you know, to kind of measure, you know, to, or determine like the moods and so on. So, What's going to happen to neutrality and those like apolitical, non-political views? And what do people really want? What's their definition of good? What's good for Russia in, in their opinion? We just don't know. Believe me, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. And I think that many people uh, have no idea too. And if people, I think it's very important for a regime to, to keep things like that, that people just, you know, stay out of politics and, you know, there, there's a saying that it's a like dirty business and it's, it's, a, it's a very beneficial uh, um, way of thinking for the government now. So they obviously don't want people to get involved in politics, but once that, you know, happens and it will happen sooner or later, uh, what's going to happen? We don't know well, and I'm very keen to, to, to observe this being here inside Russia. And the interesting thing is that the political, uh, the, the political options on a standard ballot in Russia always included against everybody. So this, uh, the, this kind of passivity. Which oh, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't have the, the, this option now, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to see all those arguments that we have every election is what's better to stay and just, I'm not, I'm just not going to be the part of it. I'm just not going to legalize this, uh, this, this terrible scheme, or it's better to go and vote for someone other than uh, United Russia candidates. We have this every other year. It's not changed. It's not going to change this argument. Well, just it, it's an internal argument in Russia and well, yeah. Sergey, your final statement probably Russia in the West. Russia in the West? Well, I mean, um, <laughs> I, I used to say, you know, until, until the, the war in Georgia, I, I, I used to say there is Russian expansionism, but there is no an offer, a proposal, a vision that Russia can offer to the West, and kind of which would have a universal appeal. And ever since, I don't think they listened to me, but they, of course it was quite something, something very logical. They have developed kind of this this ideological alternative and appeal, and this appeal of um, whatever you want to call it, traditionalism, patriarchal, a liberal understanding, um, is being now exported and or at least kind of trying to to signal and to broaden it and to make it into a universal uh, offer, and and one thing I think is important. This offer will only be popular if there is a demand on our side. And, and this appeal would only be attractive if there is an uh, attractedness on our side and among our population. And that's where we are, um, I think, an important point in this um, um, Competition, as some people say, right? I would rather say defense of universal value, values is how credible uh, we are and how value uh, firm 
and our own attitude we are and how we are able to convince our own citizens that it is worth um, standing and, 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 well, not fighting, but at least keeping uh, what we have and it is worth uh, living in a democracy of this liberal caliber that we have offered at least to the Western part of the European Union. Uh, and in the West, in the Eastern part of the European Union, we still, it's still uh, outstanding. You, we don't know what's, what's going to be the end of this, uh, of this offer. Uh, this and I think this, is, this brings us... Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the grand unknown, and it's, it's, it's up to us to choose. So I would... Uh, exactly. we so that like like brings us back home that it's not always a problems in Kremlin, but very often there's a problems which are homegrown and we have to do Absolutely. our homework as well. Absolutely. So I would like to thank all the speakers at this point and uh, all the audience. Please join our further events of Democracy Institute here at CU. We're still in Budapest. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. And thank you.